speaker is Associate Professor Grace Kong, who leads the uh, therapy service at Peter McCallum. And uh, Grace is going to tell us about the nuclear medicine specialist part in this dream team. Thank you very much, Stephen, and good afternoon, everyone. So my topic is, as mentioned, uh, nuclear medicine specialist being more than just a service provider. So hopefully I'll give you a little bit of uh, aspect from the medical perspective and also from a, a, from a practical perspective as well. But firstly, just by way of background, um, the Theranostic Service at Peter McCallum Cancer Centre has actually significantly evolved in the last 25 years. So in 1996, um, patients with neuroendocrine neoplasms were treated with theranostics treatment with a variety of different radiopharmaceuticals, but mainly with lutetium dodotate therapy since 2005. Now, we're actually a certified centre of excellence by ENETS, uh, which stands for the European Neuroendocrine Tumor Society since 2018. The first prostate cancer treated with theranostics was back in 2015. And uh, as you know, Prostic was launched in 2020. Now, currently, these patients receive theranostics uh, treatment, uh, both via clinical trials and also off trial by compassionate access as well. Just last year, we actually delivered more than 800 cycles of therapies in our center. So really making us a very comprehensive, high volume radio ligand therapy center. Now, in addition to that, we also offer other theranostics um, or radionuclide therapy as well, including radioactive iodine for thyroid cancer treatment, ichium cirrus for liver malignancy, um, iodine mapthera for lymphoma, and previously some bone-seeking radiopharmaceuticals. So to run a reliable theranostic service, I think it is really more than just a service provider. So as nuclear medicine specialists and the team, it is not just about injecting the radiopharmaceuticals. I think as the team, we need to appropriately select patients uh, for theranostics treatment. And to do that, we need to do an initial nuclear medicine consultation and to fully assess whether a patient is suitable or not. Nuclear medicine specialists need to understand different cancer types and their management options. There has to be an individualized patient-focused approach um, based on patient and disease burden factors. It is also very important to work with our colleagues um, to discuss cases at the multidisciplinary meetings to ensure that theranostics is the right treatment for that patient at the right time. So patients with prostate cancer at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center can um, access theranostics therapy via two main pathways. Uh, the first on the left uh, is by clinical trials, and you would have heard throughout the meeting that there are multiple uh, investigated initiated studies that are currently in progress. But not all patients are actually suitable for clinical trial therapies. So um, a clinical registry has been set up offering lutetium-based PSMA therapy for patients to have compassionate access um, outside of a clinical trial setting. And the clinical registry was actually set up and commenced in May of 2021. So the Prostic Registry or off-trial lutetium PSMA is supported by Prostic and Peter Mac Foundation using PSMA 617 supplied by AAA Novartis. Um, eligibility criteria is for patients who have metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, who have had prior chemotherapy and androgen deprivation therapy or deemed ineligible uh, by a medical oncologist. Patients must have progressed or be intolerant to these. And of course, the appropriate imaging phenotype so theranostics can target the disease, mainly ensuring no disease discordance uh, with a minimal uptake of, with SUV15 on the PSMA PET. And you would have seen these images throughout the meeting that disease with very minimal PSMA expression, such as the areas highlighted in red, cannot really be effectively targeted by um, theranostics and hence would not be suitable for this particular patient. So with the off-trial lutetium PSMA therapy, typically patients will receive six cycles of treatment given six weeks apart, starting with 8.5 gigabecrols for the first cycle and then reducing by 0.5 gigabecrols per cycle as per the therapy protocol. In between each cycle, patients will get blood tests done at three weeks and five weeks, including a PSA level as well, and also to monitor their adverse effects and also document quality of life. So here is a practical overview of our theranostic service at Peter Max. So when we first get a referral for a patient to consider theranostics, uh, we will arrange an initial nuclear medicine consultation. And this can be done in person or via telehealth. So after the uh, a complete assessment, the case will be discussed in a multidisciplinary meeting at our hospital. 
If the patient is deemed suitable for the treatment, then patient will be given instructions by the technologist and the radiologic therapy ordered. As Lisa mentioned, um, at PDMAC, it is given as a day treatment unless the patient needs to be admitted for medical reasons um, in our day uh, therapy suite um, located on level five for the hospital. And as also mentioned as well, after the treatment, 24 hours later, the patient will come back for post-therapy imaging. And immediately, they will also have a post-therapy consultation with the nuclear medicine specialist team as well. So the following slides, I would just like to highlight two um, important time points, just really to let you know from the medical perspective what we actually go through during the initial nuclear medicine consultation and also what we talk about during the post-therapy consult. So with the initial nuclear medicine consultation, we do spend a bit of time with the patient, uh, typically done by the therapy consultant together with the therapy fellow. So there are certain questions that we would go through, um, including, of course, prostate cancer history, such as prior treatments like chemotherapy, PSA level, PSA doubling time, which gives us an indication of the potential urgency for treatment. Of course, we need to understand the patient's clinical status at the time. So in addition to their comorbidities and performance status, continence is a very important radiation safety question, as touched on before. We also need to ensure, of course, that the hematology and biochemistry status of the patient is adequate. We also go through some disease-specific symptoms. Is the patient having pain related to prostate cancer? Will the lutetium PSMA actually help with the patient's symptoms? We also need to ask about neurological symptoms, for example, if there are symptoms suggestive of more acute neurological compromise, such as cord compression, that will need to be dealt with more urgently. And of course, to exclude obstructive uropathy. So the team who sees the patient also need to go through the PET scans very carefully to ensure that the patient has the appropriate imaging phenotype for targeting. So the team then would actually have formulated, you know, um, in their own minds whether the patient is potentially suitable and also have a good talk to the patient and discuss the potential rationale for giving lutetium PSMA for that particular patient to talk about expected outcomes and also to cover potential side effects. With all that information in context, the case will be discussed in detail in the multidisciplinary meeting to confirm that the patient is suitable for therapy. I also pick here a report template because we are a high volume center and our team is actually really growing very rapidly. So um, we do use the standardized reporting template to ensure that the team is consistent with the, the questions that we ask and also with the letter sent out to the referring doctors to keep consistency as well. So what happens during a post-therapy consultation, as mentioned, after the administration of lutetium PSMA, patient will come back at 24 hours later for uh, spec CT images. So we always see the patient again face to face, um, where we will review whether the patient had, uh, had any acute side effects uh, and to manage any potential toxicities that had risen. We also would review the post-therapy images with the patient as well, if the patient chooses to look at the images. And this is to, to look at whether there are any early changes during therapy or whether there are any acute issues. We need to decide whether to proceed to the next cycle or not, or whether any other input is required at that point in time. The last point I think is really quite critical. Um, it is really com about communication. So the team will write a letter and a report back to the medical oncology referring doctor and the GP who will be looking after the patient in the community in between the lutetium PSMA therapy. So here is just an example of a patient that we saw a couple of months ago in a post-therapy clinic. Um, as you can see on the far left um, at baseline, the patient has very avid PSMA um, disease uh, with lots of lymph nodes above and below the diaphragm. So the patient presented for cycle five of lutetium PSMA therapy. You can see the post-therapy images displayed there. The patient was actually really well, did not report any acute side effects from the treatment. Uh, he was asymptomatic. Looking at the PSA graph, really good response uh, to PSA from therapy. And the therapy images also show a gradual reduction of the uptake um, at the disease site. So this patient is actually going really, really well. So according to our protocol, he will get replete blood tests in three weeks and five weeks. The plan is to proceed with cycle six, assuming that the blood counts and clinical status remain stable. This is another example of a patient um, a little bit different. Um, on the left, you can see this patient has extensive skeletal metastatic disease, came for third cycle of lutetium PSMA therapy. Now, this patient did not report any acute effects from the actual treatment, but has actually um, got worsening pain in the left hip and spine. And the general functional status has also been declining since the commencement of therapy as well. 
the PSA level uh, for this patient is continuing to rise despite PSMA therapy. And if you look at the post-therapy images, some sites of um, disease have shown reduction of uptake, but there are some certain areas of potential concern. The red arrow uh, highlighting a lesion in the spine with continuing increasing intensity during treatment, and the green circle highlighting area in the left femur that is continuing to increase in intensity and extent, uh, which matches with the patient's symptoms. So this is a little bit of a challenging situation with open discussion with the patient. Um, the case was also discussed at the MDM as well, and the decision was not to proceed with cycle four because of imaging, PSA, and symptomatic progression, and to consider to switch over to cabazitaxel instead. So I think for nuclear medicine treatment to work well, we really need to have a team approach. As mentioned before, we need the people to make sure that the therapy is given appropriately. Um, I'm very honored and lucky to be working with a group of dedicated uh, people at Peter Mac, including medical staff, technologists, nursing staff, radiopharmaceutical scientists, physicists, radiation safety officer, administration staff and research team. But of course, we also need the infrastructure. We need the resources. It is important to have quality and policy processes in place and also support not only from the multidisciplinary team, but also from the institution as well. So my last slide is really to highlight that I think close collaboration with a multidisciplinary approach really is the most important to deliver the best care for patients with prostate cancer. We need to optimally select patients for this therapy to deliver the treatment safely, um, to make sure the patient has uh, adequate follow-up, and definitely we are more than just a service provider. So thank you very much. Thanks, Grace.